All right, so uh, I hate to say it, but I have something I've got to admit, and it's not something I'm proud of. Though, honestly, I don't understand what it possessed me to go through with it in the first place. Like, you know me, more or less. You know what kind of person I am, at, at least as far as my opinions on cartoons are concerned, but... Uh, that doesn't change the fact that I did do it. Of my own free will, with no one to guide me, I myself chose to sit down and, aware of the consequences it could bring, watched the Casa Grandes movie. I don't know why, don't try to ask me. Maybe I did it to maliciously waste the time I have left on this earth. Maybe I wanted to see if it could be a bigger trash fire than the Loud House movie. Or God forbid, maybe... Just maybe, I wanted to watch a goddamn animated movie based on a goddamn slice of life cartoon under the assumption that it would actually be slice of life. Is that so much to ask? Is it? To watch a film based on a series about some big family running a bodega in the city and not have the first thing I see be Mexico 800 years ago? Is it so inconceivable to think that that sort of film wouldn't center its main focus on Aztec demigods? Cause I feel like I'm living in crazy town right now. And this isn't a new development either. Cartoon movies based on slice of life TV shows have been overcompensating for as long as they've been around. You have a series about some nine year old football headed kid that helps people around New York? Not anymore you don't. It's a spy thriller now. He's breaking into businesses and scaling buildings and driving buses over cliffs, holy sh Shit. And that's not even going into the other one where he becomes a prophesized ancient deity that saves a village of orphan Aztec children. Not sure what's up with these movies and Aztecs, but yeah, that happens. And honestly, if I wanted to, I could keep getting more absurd. Like the Proud Family movie with sentient peanut clones trying to take over the world. Or the Recess movie where a guy tries moving the moon to bring the world into another ice age so he can abolish summer. It is a shockingly never-ending conga line of overstimulation, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Films based on slice-of-life cartoons have a big problem with grandiosity. Everything's gotta be a hundred times as intensely, radically, heart-poundingly epic for these franchises' leaps to the big screen, and to an extent, I get it. It's an exciting prospect bringing your characters to a new medium they've never been before. Not too many series can reach a level of popularity so high, they're given a chance to tell a story they couldn't under their old restraints. So with that in mind, it's perfectly reasonable to go a step beyond what you'd normally do. What else are you gonna use all that extra runtime and budget for? But at the same time, you also have to realize there's a difference between going one step beyond and Mexico 800 years ago. There's a line of believability is what I'm getting at. A line that, whether we like it or not, has been repeatedly crossed over and over again by so many of these films that didn't have to. Leading to not only jarring experiences that leave old viewers confused and new ones overwhelmed, but a whole load of other issues that bring them down even further further than they already were. It's like a really effective virus that eats away at the rest of the film as soon as it's introduced. And as we all know, the only real cure for such a pervasive sickness is alternative medicine values and essential oil submit to Scientology praise Lord Xenu and get on the mothership. But of course, in the unlikely event where that somehow doesn't work, the next best option is looking at the exceptions, examining what it is they do to avoid the disease and its symptoms. Or in other words, we gotta look at the films based on slice of life cartoons that knew how to raise the stakes to create a satisfying narrative without compromising what they're all about. And in my eyes, there are two in particular that fit this assignment. One of them is Beavis and Butthead to America, a film where the whole joke is that these two idiot sitcom characters can't comprehend the blockbuster unfolding around them, and the other is Ed and Nettie's Big Picture Show, which I'd go as far as to say is the best film based on a slice-of-life cartoon ever made. 
mm, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just gonna call it the best TV movie in the title, fuck you. But what is it that sets this movie apart from all the rest as genuinely exceptional? Well, if I was gonna give a short answer, I'd just say everything, but that doesn't really explain it, so let's start with the setup and scope. But before that, I'd like to take a minute to talk about this video sponsor, Storyiverse. A pretty interesting concept for an app that hires a group of freelance writers and artists to create exclusive short stories with animated visuals to accompany them, making for a unique format they like to call read watching. As far as art styles, they've got a large range of distinct looks going from cell shaded to black and white crime noir to mixed media, and the stories themselves have just as much variety, covering pretty much every genre you can think of to keep different audiences in mind. The whole thing's a very creator-driven space that makes sure to credit its massive list of involved talents, and I was personally pretty impressed by the production value of the story A God of Ones and Zeros, which has some absolutely wonderful animation quality for a straightforward but fun story that's well suited to the format, and I'm sure you'll find your own favorite story if you take the time to look. So if you're interested in trying out a new method for consuming media, you can download Storyiverse for free from the App Store or Google Play. And if you want to get a look at behind the scenes as well as upcoming projects, you can follow them on social media at, at Storyiverse. Thanks to the team at Storyiverse for sponsoring, and on with the video. So like I said a minute ago, a big problem with these types of films is that they can't settle for working within the bounds of the world the series created. There's apparently never enough material as is, so to compensate for the tension these films supposedly wouldn't have otherwise, they feel the need to bring in weirdly intense, death-defying scenarios, or more commonly, out of nowhere, unexplained, high fantasy bullshit. And by God, is it everywhere. I don't know if there's some unspoken Bechdel test for fantasy creatures these movies have to fulfill, and that's why it's so overdone, but for whatever reason, they've always got to have a monster or dragon or blackjack and hookers to artificially add this extra layer of phony cinematic depth, and I hate it. Hate it. Why? Because it's cheating. The writers could not meet the series on its own terms to up the scale while still fitting within the premise, so they chickened out due to a lack of creativity. Either that, or they weren't confident that a slice of life film grounded in the show's universe could be interesting without some grand spectacle. Which is equally as dumb, seeing as people don't watch slice of lives for the riveting plot. They watch it for the characters and their dynamics, the personalities of the ensemble that makes the series what it is. You don't need to sacrifice your world's integrity to make it big. All it takes is the right situation to bring out the best of your cast. And that's exactly what Big Picture Show does. You see, Ed, Ed and Eddie is a cartoon about these three kids, Ed, Double D, and Eddie, who try to scam the kids of their neighborhood however they can, leading to them getting their comeuppance every time. It's a simple idea that uses an easily repeatable format to tell fun stories with strong characters. The crew knew what made the show work, so for the film, they just kept doing what the show did, but bigger. In this case, the Eds have messed up a scam on a larger scale than ever before, and so they go on the run, hoping to avoid punishment by getting protection from Eddie's fabled older brother. There's no monsters, no dragon, no fucking Aztecs. There isn't even that much at stake besides the Eds getting pummeled worse than usual, but it's enough for them to break from the status quo, and it's something that naturally brings in the whole cast to participate, a factor that most of these films discard to focus on being grand. Remember when I mentioned the first Hey Arnold movie? The one where a nine-year-old kid becomes a secret agent and conducts corporate espionage? Yeah, you want to hypothesize where the rest of the kids were during all that? Personally, I couldn't tell you, but I can confidently say where they weren't. On screen. Oh, sorry, my bad. They showed up for a couple minutes at the start and end of the movie, so they totally weren't forgotten, guys. Didn't you see them? They had two whole lines of dialogue. And while to be fair, it isn't that egregious in all of them, you do gotta admit that a lot of the time, they'll put so much effort into being theatrical that the scope of the thing will overtake the characters, giving us less of what we like in favor of more world-ending drama that most of the cast doesn't fit into. The Loud House movie could have been a nice character study of the family structure and how they treat each other, but then the main character Link
Lincoln got caught up in literally running a small nation as an evil secretary tried to kill him. So most of the louds got sidelined for the sake of that when nobody asked for it. We just want to have fun with a cast we've gotten to watch and enjoy over the course of however many years the show it's based on has been running for. And Big Picture Show understands this. It knows very well that while the Eds are the title characters, they aren't the only ones. The show wouldn't be what it is without Ralph and Kevin and Jimmy and Sarah and Naz, so they all get their own dedicated portions. And it isn't weird like in the Jungle movie, where frankly, most of the cast felt out of place being there for a film so clearly centered around solely Arnold. No, as the victims of the Ed's latest scam, these guys have all the reason in the world to go after them and play major roles in the narrative. It makes total sense, and all of their respective subplots are both entertaining and relevant as they're always one step behind the Eds following their trail. Er, other than Johnny, who doesn't interact with anyone or do much of anything until the end, but hey, keeping eight out of nine major characters from feeling tacked on is pretty impressive in its own rights. And they aren't shortchanged in terms of screen time either. Everyone feels like they get just the right amount of attention to showcase their personalities. I've got no doubt in my mind that if you hadn't watched the show before, you could get a pretty clear picture of what it's about through watching this movie. And that's another thing it excels at by keeping things things simple but effective. Despite being a finale for the series that contains loads of callbacks, developments, and answer questions for fans who've stuck around, you could come into it blind and have an equally good experience. A balance that's tough to keep from going too far in one direction or the other, as shown by how most of the time these slice of life movies absolutely fail due to their insecure over ambition. Like if a friend told me they wanted a taste of how We Bear Bears is, I wouldn't direct them to the movie, since although it does carry over some of the show's themes, it doesn't accurately depict what the show's about at all. All. And, uh, okay, I mentioned We Bear Bears so I could use a different example, but the Casa Grandes movie, oh my god, what were they smoking? My point is, a film based on a series should strike a good medium between fan service and its own strength. Introducing newcomers to the world without giving the wrong impression or repeating information old viewers already know. And guess what, baby? You already know that Big Picture Show nails it. And same as the film itself's qualities, there are too many examples Examples for me to list, so I'll just stick to a couple highlights. By opening the film on the aftermath of the Ed scheme, letting their reactions do all the talking for how bad it was, the audience is, from the beginning, being told so much from so many angles. For old viewers, we can piece together what's happening through implication and revel in the antics, knowing this is worse than usual. Whereas new viewers are drawn in by the mystery and get to know the Eds through how they choose to panic. Reinforcing those personalities over a majority of the runtime until the moment everything changes. When Double D gets fed up with Eddie's bullshit, finally sticking up for himself, and Eddie admits their predicament is his fault. Now, this is a great moment in the film as is. It establishes Double D's neuroticism from his introduction, and gives his frustration with Eddie's antics time to build until he reaches a breaking point, giving Eddie a new appreciation for him as a friend. It's a well done conflict that does a good job establishing their brotherly bond. But when you view it through the lens of this dichotomy going unchanged for five seasons, it reaches a whole nother level of satisfying, and everything having to do with Eddie's brother? Absolute perfection. On one hand, for first time audiences, build up to the reveal of Eddie's brother being an abusive asshole that barely cares about him is already super effective. I mean, for the whole movie, Eddie does nothing but talk up how great his big brother is, all the amazing things he's done and how much Eddie loves him, and then it turns out he's a jerk that treats Eddie with all the love of a fucking cockroach? Mm. That's brutal. It recontextualizes every move he made across the film, and far exceeds most of the ones I've talked about that go for spectacle over character growth. But more than that, for fans of the series, it recontextualizes the entire show. Across 130 episodes, we spent time watching Eddie and the gang try to fit in, to be liked, to be thought of as cool no matter what it took. And the neighborhood kids didn't really take to him because he was such a lying little schemer that deserved every punishment 
punishment he ever got. But looking back, knowing most of his brags were also lies made up purely to cover for the fact he had an abusive brother he, in spite of everything, still idolized and modeled himself after? That shit goes deep. It makes all of Eddie's behavior across the series so much more understandable, and beyond that, it gives the neighborhood kids sticking up for and accepting the Eds an extra layer of power that really drives home this is the finale of the series. You feel the triumph of them finally getting friends after so long, having grown to truly deserve them. And what's so awesome is that, though it doesn't hit quite as hard if you're new to the franchise, the arcs, characterization, jokes, plot, and emotions are just as impactful for a regular movie-going experience. It works whether you're familiar with it or not, and that's so goddamn praiseworthy. Do you realize how many of these films don't work as pieces connected to the shows they come from, let alone as individual narratives? Most of them. And I said it once, I'll say it again, the root cause of them sucking is their inability to accept what they are. Every single time, they've gotta be grander, zanier, world at stakier. They've gotta be larger than life. But that's not the appeal. That isn't why we fell in love with these series to begin with. We came for the characters, the relatability, the fun. We came to see a slice of their lives. All you needed to do was show us a bigger piece of them. I've been Just Stop. You've been impossible to find on streaming services. Thanks for watching.